Welcome to Essentials Week 4. Well, there's nothing PG about this week's Genesis readings. We begin in chapter 17 with the covenant of circumcision, and we move to the threat of violent sexual assault in the city of Sodom, followed by mass destruction of that city and the surrounding plains. And then we read about Lot's daughters scheming for and succeeding in incestuous pregnancies with their father. And finally, in chapter 20, we discover Abraham asking Sarah to pretend to be his sister instead of his wife when they meet up with Abimelech. And while this plan apparently protects Abraham from confrontation with the king, it exposes Sarah to the vulnerable status of being unmarried in the king's polygamous court. By the grace of God, Sarah is protected and Abimelech does not touch her. But much of the behavior is as sordid as season two in Game of Thrones. Where is God in all this, we wonder? To that point, in chapter 17, we have five long speeches directly from God. Scholars sensibly refer to this as divine speech. It is very significant and occurs much less frequently after this chapter. The promises God makes, which expand upon what has already been promised to Abraham, are very significant as well. At the beginning of chapter 17, we learn that it has been 13 years since the birth of Ishmael. And this was the child that Abraham had with Sarai's slave in a premature attempt to fulfill the promise of an heir. And this, by the way, is unfaithful of Abraham. Part of uh, what God uh, approved of in Abraham was his belief, was his faith that God's promises were true. <clears throat> and when Abraham doubts the fulfillment of God's promise and decides he has to actually make it happen himself, uh, that's showing a lack of faith. Well, Abraham has convinced himself that Ishmael is the son whom God was intending to provide, and Sarai has lost all hope of bearing a child herself, even though God made the promise to Abram and Sarai, not to Abram and Hagar. Into this situation, God speaks. He expands the promise that Abraham will be the father of a nation to becoming the father of many nations. Pertaining to that, Abram is renamed Abraham. Sarah will be renamed, actually Sarai will be renamed Sarah. The context indicates that the new name is exalted, although scholars do not know precisely what the new ending means, but perhaps it signifies royal status. This giving of a new name is a theme we will see repeated. Jacob will become Israel. God specifies that the covenant will be eternal, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring to be God to you and to your offspring for an everlasting covenant. And finally, the land promise is specified to encompass all of Canaan. But unlike the covenant in chapter 12, in which the promise had no contingencies, this promise involves Abraham's response. It depends upon it. He is to walk before God, and he and his household and his male descendants are to be circumcised, and if they are not, they will be cut off. The practice of circumcision was not uncommon in the ancient Near East, but for the Jewish people, it carried unique sacramental significance in marking them as God's covenantal people. They were to be set apart. And as circumcision is the removal of the male foreskin, it certainly claims for God's people in a visible way 
a dedication of sexual activity to God's purposes. I don't know if you've ever been writing with a pen and read on its shaft that it is from, say, the Bible Believers Church. Well, as you're writing with that pen, you wonder if the words that are flowing from it are consistent with its intended purposes. And when we reflect on the content of chapters 17 through 20, we realize that much of it pertains to improper, violent, and exploitative sexual activity. Before he was circumcised, Abraham used Hagar, Sarah's servant, for his purposes. And as easily as he decided to use her at Sarah's bidding, he later discarded her, sent her into the desert to die. The Sodom episode is basically a gang rape that is narrowly avoided. And Lot's daughters, just so we don't fall into the trap of thinking it is only men who are capable of sexual exploitation, Lot's daughters seduce their father. The point I'm making here is that God's covenant with its stipulations is marking his people, setting them apart to adhere to different sexual standards. We will continue to discover how God's people often do not uphold these standards. But if we read the text closely, we will realize that those actions are not condoned. God continues to pledge his fidelity and to require holiness from his people. Part of that holiness was manifest in this generational promise to Abraham. God would be faithful to Abraham and Sarah and would give them a son, Isaac. And through that son, the covenant promises would continue to be enfleshed. There is a moment in the reading when Abraham begs God to bless Ishmael and to make him the one, the son of promise. And God says, no, that was never what I said that I would do. The promises will be fulfilled through Isaac. But then God does say, but I will bless your other son in different ways. God, through his fidelity, would bring into being a holy nation. As you discuss this text, think about how the Christian sacrament of baptism relates to the covenantal practice of circumcision. And what are the implications of these rites? Why do you think the early Christian community decided that circumcision was no longer necessary, but that baptism was?